way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. And hello, America, and welcome to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth. Happy Fourth of July weekend. It's great to have you along. This is a classic rewind of Extreme Genes dating back to 2016. My interview with Sam Rokin, who starred in one of my favorite TV shows of the past decade, Turn Washington Spies. I hope you enjoy Sam's insight on the revolution and you have a great holiday weekend. And do you have an interest in the American Revolution? Do you have ancestors who fought against or maybe on behalf of the king? Well, this week, season three of AMC's Turn, Washington Spies, about the Culper spy ring, begins. The first episode is Monday night at 10 o'clock Eastern time. And this season takes us to the key moment of the revolution, the betrayal of Benedict Arnold. And uh, I've identified five ancestors who were actively involved in the revolution in the Northeast and 13 on my wife's side, all from the South, mostly Virginia. Well, the guy who plays the very warped, the very evil, Captain John Graves Simcoe, an actor named Sam Roken, is going to join us in the show later today. And we're going to talk to him for two segments about what he's learned about the history of the Revolution, the character he plays, who is an actual person. In fact, he became the lieutenant governor of a province in Canada and freed slaves in 1791. So I'm very excited for you to meet Sam Roken who plays John Graves Simcoe on Turn a little bit later on in the show. And then, of course, Tom Perry's going to tell you about video editing and a video editing program that you can use for your old home movies and videos. It's cheap, like free, and you'll be able to do things at home that only Hollywood people could do just a few years ago. That's later in the show. Well, as you know, David Allen Lambert, the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, usually joins us on the show. He's in London these days. We've had him on via Skype the last couple of weeks. Well, this week, he went to an area where we found out the Wi-Fi was just a little bit weak, and so it uh, just isn't going to happen today. So I'm going to have to carry the whole thing myself. I'm exhausted just thinking about it. So we start our family histoire news with this. Genealogy Roadshow is returning to PBS with its premiere for this season happening on Tuesday, May 17th. And the cities they're going to be visiting this year include Albuquerque, Miami, Houston, Boston, Providence, and Los Angeles. They kind of pick these places because they feel it's representative of the cultural crossroads for diversity and industry and history history and deep pools of riveting stories. So it's going to be interesting to see what Kenyatta Berry and Josh Taylor and Mary Tedesco come up with this season. Remember again, PBS May 17th. Well, it wouldn't surprise me at all if David Lambert wasn't aware of this. There's a rug designer over in England in Wiltshire named Luke Irwin, and he and his family wanted to convert a barn on their new property that they had just bought, and they wanted to convert it into a ping-pong room. So they brought in the electricians to do this underground cable and and put the barn in lights. Well, when the workmen began drilling into the ground, they hit this layer of mosaic tile. Yeah, intricate red, white, and blue. Well, this guy, Irwin, he knew the significance of this. He said that no one since the Romans had laid mosaics in Britain to use as house floors. So they were able to actually put an end to the work from the workmen before they actually started busting it up. Irwin called in archaeologists and they ran tests and they found that this mosaic went back from sometime between 175 and 220 AD, but they've determined it's a Roman villa courtyard. Well, here's a story that's been making a lot of news this week. Georgetown University was founded centuries ago by Jesuit Catholic priests. Well, it turns out in 1838, the university, which was then a college, got into some financial problems. Well, they owned slaves, a lot of them, over 230 of them. And they decided the only way they were going to get out of debt 
was to sell the slaves to the market in New Orleans. And this is all very well documented and found within the archives of what is currently Georgetown University. Well, the story is beginning to gain a lot more traction as people have come to understand who these people were. There were families, there were babies, women, men, old, young. The ship's manifest, as they were sent off to New Orleans, really tell a story of great hardship. There's one account from a Jesuit priest associated with the school who didn't approve of all this as saying that one woman was actually on the dock begging and wondering and asking what she had done to deserve this. Well, the university obtained a lot of money as the result and wound up paying off their debts. Today, Georgetown University still exists because of the money they raised by selling their slaves down to New Orleans. Now, the Catholic overseers of the school in Rome at the time disapproved of this move. It was made contrary to their orders. And so now an effort is underway to identify the descendants of these 230-some-odd slaves that were sold by Georgetown University and try to determine if there's some way to make reparations for what was done to their people. And next week, we're going to talk to one of those descendants about this experience. She happens to be the president of a genealogical society in Washington. It's going to be fascinating to hear what she has to say about her viewpoint on this incredible story from the 19th century. You can read about it in the New York Times and find the link at ExtremeGenes.com. Well, good news from AmericanAncestors.org and the New England Historic Genealogical Society. Their long-running published quarterly, the New England Historical and Genealogical Register, with over 400 million searchable names, is now complete and in digital format in their databases. So you can log in now with your NEHGS membership or guest account and check out all this incredible information that's waiting for you now. And just a reminder, all of our shows are now entirely searchable, yet we transcribe them. So if you want to remember some of the things we talk about or find something further about it once you've heard it, just go to ExtremeGenes.com, go to our podcast section, and search the transcripts. And coming up next, we're going to talk to the man who plays the very evil, Captain John Graves Simcoe, on the AMC series Turn, Washington Spies. The series is coming back for their third season starting Monday. Monday night at 10 o'clock Eastern. Sam Roken joins the show coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's family history show and ExtremeGenes.com. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Genies, 10 years ago, in April of 2012, when the government released the 1940 census, it took Ancestry several months to complete and review an accurate index. Fast forward to today, using proprietary handwriting reading software, it took Ancestry only nine days to get the job done with the 1950 census. Now they held back results for a time for actual humans to review what the software had created. And after just a few weeks, it became obvious the software was near perfect and the computer generated index to 153,000 names has been released. What does this mean in your journey to research your family? It means you can search the entire database quickly and easily for your family members. Never has a U.S. Census Index been created as quickly as this. Go to Ancestry.com today, click on the 1950 Census on the homepage, and see what you can discover. 
Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow Genies and ask questions because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and and Breakthrough Strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. My name is Captain John Grave Simcoe, and I'm your new commander by orders of Major John Andre. And that is the voice of Sam Rokin. He plays Captain John Graves Simcoe on the AMC Revolutionary Series Turn, Washington Spies, the Culper Spy Ring. Hi, it is Fisher, and you're with Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. And if you have followed our program for any time at all, you know that I'm a huge fan of this program. And for some time now, I've been working to get one of my favorite characters from the show on this show. And uh, Sam is on the line with us right now. How are you, Sam? Welcome to Extreme Genes. Thank you. It's good to be with you. I'm just uh, absolutely astonished by your character. And has it changed your life a little bit? I'm sure you get an awful lot of comments because, uh, let's face it, as you portray John Graves Simcoe, he's bloodthirsty, he's twisted, he's ruthless, he has enemies on both sides, uh, he's fiercely loyal to the king, but he also needs love. Yeah, he's um, he's a complicated guy. Uh, and... Um uh, yeah, it's been it's had a huge effect in my life. You know, it really put me on the map here, and um, you know, such a, a divisive character that you know people have a really strong opinion about him. But on the whole, people are very nice. But, you know, usually the comment is that they just love to hate me, so I'm all right with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, hey, as an actor, as long as they love you for anything, that's not a bad thing. And you were in Harry Potter and the the Deathly Hallows as well. You were a snatcher in that. So obviously they have a tendency to bring you in for some, shall we say, dark characters. Yeah, I'm going to start taking this personally. I don't know what I don't know what the problem is. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, uh, from my perspective, as long as the characters have some uh, have some depth and richness to them, then um, I get excited about it. And, um, and and as far as it goes with the more nasty characters, generally they are a little bit more complex and, and usually get written in that way. And so uh, I'm cool with it, really. I, I enjoy digging into these guys' psyches, and um, obviously I'm developing a bit of a knack for doing it, apparently. Well, and in speaking to you, I'm sure a lot of listeners who are familiar with the show are, are noticing the same thing that I am, that you don't speak like your character. You're from a different part of England, obviously, than uh, Simcoe is. How do you work those accent differences? Well, um, yeah, I mean, you know, all of that stuff is so important, you know, like the costume and, and the hair and everything else, you know, it's the first thing we see and when he speaks, it's the first thing we hear. So, you know, I take those things really seriously because I think they really, um, you know, they're a window into who the, who the guy actually is or, you know, whoever you're playing is. And so obviously basics are, you know, where's this guy from? You know, where do we locate him in the, in the world? And, and that's one part of it. And then... You know, obviously, like, my, my voice naturally is in a much deeper register than, than his. And that yeah. really just came from some discussions with um, Craig Silverstein, the showrunner. And uh, when we originally did the pilot, Rupert Wyatt, uh, who directed it, you know, we were talking about the kind of guy that this is. And, uh, and I wanted him, you know, I thought it'd be kind of obvious to have this kind of brute, which it could have easily come out as, you know. He, they were obviously writing a villain in this character and and it would have been very easy to sort of just make him like a typically like nasty piece of work uh, and i didn't <laughs> want to be typical with him because i thought there was something a little more interesting in there and, and so really it became about wanting him to have a bit, kind of a delicate touch and, and and the question i asked myself was what would happen if this if this guy was uh really nice to everybody 
and so that it becomes about you know and that came out and then it just sort of came out and the way you know he had a lightness of touch in the way he spoke and i thought you know it's going to be much more impactful if this guy is nasty because of the things he does rather than your initial impression of him you know and, and that's sort of how it started developing and then it just sort of took it on in life of its own well, let me ask you about this. One of the things I noticed in one of the early episodes is your overpronunciation of names. You talked about <laughs> Talmadge yeah, and Brewster. Where did that come yeah, from? So the good one is, uh, is Woodhull. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, you know, he has a love for language. You know, he all, John Simcoe, you know, I mean, a lot of this as well, it's not just me having fun with it. You know, there is some, uh, there's some substance to it. So, so. You know, John John Grove Simcoe was uh, was a poet, and in fact has the first recorded Valentine's poem. That yes. We know about and I was interested in his love for language. I, it wasn't something I actually um, consciously did. It just started happening. You know, and then I realised that I wasn't saying these names the same as everybody else, and then it just kind of stuck. <laughs> so, um, but you know, I, I saw, I read Woodhull. I didn't read Woodall or something, you know, I read, I was just saying what I saw really as a character and that's how it came out. But I, you know, but yeah, but it does give him like a, a you know, an individuality that I uh, hadn't really planned for, but um, obviously um, contributes to the whole thing, you know. So uh, yeah, good uh, observation. <laughs> oh, I loved it. I loved it when it came to Talmadge. <laughs> I thought it was yeah, great. Talmadge is a good one as well, yeah. Yes. Everyone else says Talmadge. Well, I, now, I, I have to tell you, I really just was saying what I saw. Uh, I guess I was I was inside the guy, you know, and um, that's how it came out. Well, now that's the question. You know, this show is about family history, and of course, people who listen to it are also into history. And my fascination with the program is the representation of how my ancestors may have lived under British occupation at that time. Yeah. And so there's a, a tremendous realism. I mean, you see the tavern wench emptying the chamber pot right outside the door of the place, and then going in and serving food. <laughs> you know, I think, wow. Yeah. Uh, yes, there was no uh, there was no health and safety department <laughs> in uh, in Not Isn't that the great thing about it though? Is is um, and it, uh, about all, all you know lots of lots of really great historical television and film that's come out is that the reason why we care is because we realize apart from having, you know knowing what our heritage is and knowing how we came to be now uh, and what came before us. It's also that you know they were just like us. You know, it's, yes. very, it's, a, it's sort of um, it's a mind trick that we, we put the people in the past uh, as almost like a different species. And I think one of the beautiful things about uh, portraying it in drama is that we have the opportunity to humanize history. And I think that's a, a really key element to why we're interested in it, you know. And, and when those human moments come out, it's really satisfying, I think. Well, I think you've really hit it on the head. The fascinating thing is watching the challenges. I mean, we've always thought of, in this country, of course, the patriots are the good guys, and you guys are the bad guys. And we're seeing Abe Woodhull changing now. He's becoming very much as bloodthirsty as anybody else in this series. The evolution is he has to go through to to fight to survive. Yeah, that's very true. And I think... Um, you know, it's really an indication of how war is a, is a unique experience now and then uh, and has a very unique effect on the people involved in it. Um, and, um, and I think the, the optics in war are very different, you know, and I think people, it has to change you, doesn't it? You know, if you're, if you're, if you're being occupied, if you feel you have to, if you're compelled to, to do something about that. And to, I think people do things during wartime that they would never have imagined doing in another environment. So, yeah, I, it's a really good observation. And I think particularly in someone like Abe, who, who was just a normal, regular farmer doing his thing and getting on with his life, is suddenly put into this extraordinary situation and we see him change before our eyes. I mean, I think that's a very compelling thing. But, you know, equally, I think all the characters go through that. You know, even someone like Washington or, you know, Benedict Arnold or, you know, any of these guys who, you know, John Andre, everybody really could change. And that's one of the great things about season three of Turn, I think, is that, you know, we're really seeing the effect of the war on these people and how it's changing them. Uh, and changing the the way they go about their lives is fascinating. 
We're talking to Sam Roken. He plays Captain John Graves Simcoe on the AMC Revolutionary Series Turn, Washington Spies. And, and Sam, I, I actually have a, an ancestor who is buried in the same churchyard with Caleb Brewster in uh, Fairfield, Connecticut. Have you had the chance well, to go to some of these places that uh, you're portraying? Have you been to Setauket yet? I haven't been to Setauket, no. I did actually, I lived in New Jersey for a while. Everywhere I would go, you know, I would see plaques and and I started to become, you know, a plaque hunter. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and where we shoot the show in Virginia, you know, there's also some really key revolutionary sites around here as well. You know, and in fact, we keep coming across places where, you know, Simcoe and his troops were stationed at one point because they moved around so much, particularly the Rangers. But just by accident, in fact, I, I, I've come across a lot of places. So, but yeah, I do. I do try and um, go to as many sites that are relevant as, as I can. And you know, I went, recently um, went to Washington's headquarters in New Jersey, and where it, uh, one of his camps was. And it's just kind of cool. It's cool to kind of be standing where they stood. Yeah. So I, I have been to some. I actually haven't been to talk it, but I do. Funnily enough, we a lot. We do have fans who are into talk it, and uh, we often get. Um, uh, we often get messages from from those guys. I think they're really happy that that their town is um, is being celebrated. You know. Well, it was a you know the whole story was fascinating. In fact, I read a book about this, and then a week later, I learned that your show was coming on, and I just couldn't wait. And it was very exciting. Hey, we're going to take a break, and when we return, we're going to talk more with Sam Roken, Captain John Graves Simcoe from the AMC Revolutionary Series Turn Washington Spies. We're, we're going to talk about some of the real people, Sam, and uh, how how those folks have affected your character and some of the other characters you work with. All right. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. All right. And before we take that break, I should mention that Turn, Washington Spies, returns for Season 3 this coming Monday, April 25th. It's a new time slot, new day for Turn. And this season, we're going to see the actual evolution as we start moving towards Benedict Arnold's betrayal. And it's going to be a great season coming up on AMC, 10 o'clock Eastern, 9 o'clock Central. Figure it out where you are. We'll be back with our next segment with Sam Roken from Turn, Washington Spies in five minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. back America's family history show extreme genes and extremegenes.com it is Fisher here the radio root sleuth talking to Sam Roken he is Captain John Graves Simcoe on the AMC Revolutionary Series Turn Washington Spies and Sam I've got to tell you right now my wife is totally creeped out by your character and, uh, and she says why do you have to talk to the bad guy why can't I said well because I think they're more interesting because you try to figure out just what is it that makes these people tick. And I'm sure as, as an actor, you have to kind of think that way yourself, don't you? I do. Uh, uh, your wife's a very smart lady. Uh, <laughs> I, no, I, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by human beings. I think most actors are, and that's one of the, the reasons why we're compelled to do it. You know, We're very curious about the way people think and why people do what they do and the way that they do them. And so it turns out that when you are dealing with, for example, sociopaths, we're not like that in our normal lives, thankfully. So to make that journey and, and to go on that voyage of discovery, is, it's kind of a really joyous thing for an actor. So, we're, you know, we're as compelled to access the brains of these people as, as the audience is, hopefully, to watch them, you know. Well, and, and so that brings us to the question, how much of the real John Graves Simcoe, who went on to become, what, lieutenant governor up in uh, Canada, he was the guy who signed off on the first anti-slavery bill in 1791. I mean, he did a lot of really good things. Do you feel any yeah. obligation to him <laughs> as you portray him? Yeah, I think so. You know, it touches on what we talked about in the first segment when, when we were discussing this, which is... During wartime, I think people are changed, and I think they act in a way that they might not otherwise. And so for me, you know, first of all, you know, the only evidence we have of what the man was like, his own memoirs, which 
necessarily are favorable towards himself right and what he did and the listed historical events and achievements that he was involved in we have some you know we have his delicate more literary side to go on you know his poetry and then we have the things he did after the war so that they're facts you know we've not met the man and we don't know what he's like we just know the things he did in his life which vary massively um, and there's no question that the, that the Rangers during the war were a ruthless and very precise operation. Uh, you know, really, the, the way to, uh, to think of them is they're like the, the special forces yeah. of the army, you know, and they're sent in on very specific stealth missions, and they carried them out really well uh, and with, with great effect. And so the answer to your question in a more concise way is that People are different during the war to afterwards. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, I can square away his behavior on the show with what he did afterwards because I think the more ruthless, uh, more deadly you were during the war, the more you would want to appease that in your life afterwards. And I don't think that we have portrayed, whilst we do portray a guy that is ruthless, does make uh, impulsive, deadly decisions, and that are not necessarily on the moral compass of everybody else in the world. Uh, at the same time, there is a soul there, you know, and there is some tenderness. And we see it come out in, in various different ways. And there are, you know, and I think there is some compassion there too. It's just he's a guy you don't want to cross because it will end very badly. <laughs> but, I think, you know, but, I think, but after the war, you know, I, I think it's a different world. And I think people adapt. And I think they vary experiences, too. And who's to say that you couldn't behave in an egregious manner during the war and then try to do better, try to compensate for that? Even if he wasn't quite as nasty as, as he comes across sometimes on turn, it's fair to say that he didn't do the things he did during the war, after the war. We know that. And so um, that's really how I personally square it away with what we do on the show. You know? Yeah, and that, that makes perfect sense. And it's interesting, too, because when the show started, I was immediately going to the Internet to go, okay, how much is this true? Did this happen? Did that happen? And I found the timelines were different. Abe Woodhull's father was a patriot, not a loyalist. But obviously, they were portraying this to show how families were divided. And then I was accepting of that. Yes, this is an historical novel brought to television. And it's interesting to know that John Graves Simcoe actually brought the Queen's Rangers in and beat up Abe's dad to send Abe a message in real life. That's what really happened because they had received word that Abe was a spy. A completely different scenario, though. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up because that's exactly the point I was making. So, you know, there is enough evidence to suggest that he did a few things that most people would say are egregious. And those are the things we know about. And, you know, I also picked up on just a couple of, you know, a few things. So I've read his memoirs and I've read the diaries about the Rangers and what have you. And a couple of things, there was a pattern that was developing, particularly in the third person written memoirs of Simcoe, which they would arrive in a place and then they would stay in this house here and this house here. Right. They'd uh, occupy. I was like, well, how did you get that house? Who was in it before you? And what happened to the people that were in it when you arrived? I'm sure you didn't just say, would you mind if we stay in it instead of you? you know? <laughs> right. And so things like that crop up. And, I, and I'm like, well, well, there has to be a story there that's just not being told. And I feel like that gray area of history books is really interesting. And I think allows for a little bit of poetic license that doesn't necessarily feel too far-fetched you know so we, we never know for sure do we because what gets written down you know the truth changes a little bit as soon as it's written down so yeah i think there's some uh, there's some leeway in that and it's written by the winners that's right Exactly. Yeah. So uh, one last thing, because we're running out of time here, Sam, but it's interesting because you cannot be killed. I mean, it's been I've seen you get stabbed. I've seen you get shot. I've seen you get knocked out. I've, you know, you are you are not allowed to die. But in the pilot of this show, you were killed and then yeah. brought back to life. <laughs> Talk a little about that. Well, it was extraordinary, really. Yeah. Originally, I auditioned for John Andre's character. And got so far down that road, and um, obviously J.J. Fields um, 
uh, was offered the role and plays it exceptionally well. Yes, he's um, fabulous. I've got so much respect for him. And so I thought, well, okay, that job's not happening. And then they said, well, we'd love you to do Simcoe. He's kind of just in the pilot, but uh, it's a great part. And so I said, yes, obviously. And, and then we did it. And um, yeah, he dies. He got shot. And as it came out in the wash, Caleb um, kicks him in the face. And then he goes, you know, then they torture him for a bit in in, the, in their cell. But in the original pilot, he shot him in the face. And that was the end of that. But AMC found the character compelling. Right. And I think, you know, he also has a really important function on uh, dramatically on the show. You know, we needed a, like a regular antagonist. Yes. And so Simco provided that quality. And it was a real compliment to what I brought to the character. Um, I don't think they quite saw it there originally, but... I just kind of gave it everything, and you were supposed to be on the show for longer, and then you're not. But this way around is kind of an extraordinary event, which I'm so very grateful for, you know. <laughs> great ride. Well, I don't think we'd be in the third season of Turn if you were not in that role. No doubt about it. Thank you. That's a really nice compliment. Well, Sam Roken, thank you so much for your time, and uh, thank you for all you put into this character and, and bringing the revolution to life for those of us who love it. Let me ask you this. You said you lived in New Jersey. You've obviously been here for a little bit. Are you looking for dual citizenship? Well, uh, my wife is American, so I'm currently a, a permanent resident. I have a 10-year green card, and I'm very much here. I think, I can, I think I'm just about allowed to become a citizen, and I think I probably will, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I love America. This is my home now, so my family's here. and So who knows? We'll see. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sam Roken from Turn Washington Spies on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Genies, 10 years ago, in April of 2012, when the government released the 1940 census, it took Ancestry several months to complete and review an accurate index. Fast forward to today, using proprietary handwriting reading software, it took Ancestry only nine days to get the job done with the 1950 census. Now they held back results for a time for actual humans to review what the software had created. And after just a few weeks, it became obvious the software was near perfect and the computer generated index to 153,000 names has been released. What does this mean in your journey to research your family? It means you can search the entire database quickly and easily for your family members. Never has a U.S. Census Index been created as quickly as this. Go to Ancestry.com today, click on the 1950 Census on the homepage, and see what you can discover. Have you hit a brick wall in your family tree? Are you unsure how to use your DNA test results to resolve a research question? Do you want to travel where your ancestors walked and need to find details before you go? Need help joining a lineage society? Whatever your genealogy research question, the answer is Legacy Tree Genealogist. Legacy Tree Genealogist has been helping clients all over the globe discover their story since 2004. Legacy Tree has carefully selected and trained professionals who specialize in hundreds of countries and languages, as well as probate research and DNA analysis. And when you need experts on the ground in the countries where your ancestors came from, Legacy Tree Genealogists calls upon its global network of on-site researchers who know the local language and how to get their hands on the records you need. Request your free quote today at LegacyTree.com. That's LegacyTree.com. Hey, Genies. As we've dug into our family history explorations over the past year, our community at Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies has taken off. This is where you can meet like-minded genealogists who can help you break through those brick walls and find a whole city behind it occupied by ancestors whose names you don't even know yet. This is where you can learn from your fellow Genies and ask questions because many in our community have already been into some of the records you're looking for. Genealogy and 
and breakthrough strategies is free. What a great place for brainstorming and getting to know other people who totally get your passion for family history research. If you're looking to take the next step in sharpening your skills, here's a great chance to learn from others and give back in areas you've already become expert in. So join us. That page again is Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. It's a long name, but we cover a lot of territory. Genealogy and Family History Breakthrough Strategies. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is preservation time with my good friend Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com, the preservation authority. How are you, Tom? Super duper, thanks. I was thinking about how over the last several months, we've been talking periodically about a software called Cinematize that you recommend very highly. And it's gone the way of the dinosaurs to some extent. And if you could find it, great, buy it. It's probably on the cheap but now you've been looking for something to replace that, some new kind of software, and what have you come up with? Well, we're working with some kind of software that we're actually testing right now in our studio, and so far it's very, very promising. I don't want to get into a lot about it until we actually get some of the bugs out of the way. But next week we'll be able to probably have some good information about it. We've been using it so far. It's been flawless. But there's a couple other things I want to check. I want to check internet compatibility that will make it so you can share it with friends. It's easy to use. And if this software works out like we think it is, it's almost going to be the mother load of software. It's very inexpensive. It's under $50. Wow. There's some certain software requirements. And if you have anything older than Snow Leopard, it won't work with it. But it is amazing software. In fact, it'll actually let you deal with MP3s, MP4s outside of the Apple format. Wait, wait. You are taunting us here. You're telling us all the great things it does, <laughs> and you're not going to tell us the name for another week or so? Nope. It's like the cliffhanger. At least it'll be right. this season. You don't have to wait till the start of next season. <laughs> all right. Can you tell us about another one you may have found that would be of, of use that you Ab- could tell us right now? Absolutely. This is a great software. It's called DaVinci Resolve 12, just like the famous... Yeah, that guy. Inventor, him. Right. And this is awesome software. <laughs> I followed these guys from when they had DaVinci number one. Wow. And it's great. It's got editing capabilities. It's got color correction that's just absolutely incredible. And the neat thing about this is they have a version right now that you can download for free. No charge. Hello. No. Oh, it's great. It's just really amazing. So people that want to kind of delve into color correction, this is a good option to go and get because you can play around with it. It's non-destructible. And are we talking about moving pictures or are we talking about stills or both? This is all movie. I'm sorry. Yeah, this is movie type stuff. In fact, they use this uh, software in Hollywood for your big blockbusters like Avatar and shows like that. So it's an incredible software. This software is so smart. People think, oh, yeah, this is a high-end software. I'm not into that kind of stuff. I don't shoot in 4K. Well, what's neat about this software, you can set it up for different formats, whether you're using standard definition from your old VHS tapes, whether you have one of those really cool 4K cameras, just about anything that you have, you can use it on this. Wow. So this is exciting stuff. Oh, it is. It's great. You can do stuff. You can sync stuff. So if you have some old movies that somebody shot in the old days, sometimes you're shooting your 8mm camera and you have a, a side recorder. It's not recording the sound on the tape. And they get out of sync. People that do music videos, whether they're for the family or whatever, that's one of the biggest problems. And this has some sync capabilities that's absolutely incredible. In the days when I used to do music videos, you had to do everything vocally. Right. And you couldn't see the vocal part. You can see the picture and trying to line them up was really hard. The audio was a problem. Exactly. Trying to get them to line up was really, really tough. With this, they've got this way you can put the time code on the clips, then you can put it together. So like if you're using something from an old concert, a wedding, if you have two camera interviews and you want to cut from person to person, for instance, say you're interviewing grandma and grandpa and you want to have a separate camera on each one of them, you can do this and this DaVinci software will allow you to go in and sync the two together. So you can say, okay, here's grandma talking. I want to use this part. Here's grandpa talking. I want to use this part. I want to dissolve from here to here. 
So you're not sitting there doing one and then going back and figuring out, I need to do this. It makes it really nice. All right. And this is very good, by the way, for getting younger people involved with your projects if you get a little nervous about working with software like this. That's what's neat about getting the kids involved with Grandma and Grandpa. You can do stuff as a family. All right. What are we going to talk about next, Tom? Let's talk about some color correction. All right. Getting to it in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. You're listening to a classic rewind of Extreme Jeans from 2016. Hope you're having a great 4th of July weekend. Hey, it is the final segment of our show for this week, Extreme Jeans, America's Family History Show, and we're talking preservation with Tom Perry. By the way, if you have questions for Tom, you can always send him an email at asktom at tmcplace.com. And uh, Tom, we were just talking about this great new software that you've discovered that you recommended moments ago, the DaVinci 12, very exciting stuff, and another one you're working on. But you were mentioning color correction. And, you know, this is starting to get, I think, above a lot of people's pay scale <laughs> to, it, to think about some of these softwares. And that is so true. I mean, we can just talk about five years ago. What has happened in the last five years is incredible. Color correction, in fact, even a year ago, talking to you know consumers that walk in our door or send us letters or send us stuff from across the country, color correction wasn't even an option for people to do. It was right. like, no, if you want it color corrected, we need to do it for you. It's not very expensive. However, we need to do it. Now, with this DaVinci 12 software, the color correction options it has is absolutely incredible. It has a dynamic track. So when you're actually looking at it on your computer terminal, on your monitor, you can actually physically see the sound. It's like 3 D. Wow. So you can see, oh, this is when, you know, the refrigerator kicks in and I need to cut it off. So you go in and <laughs> edit it. You can edit that out. Wow. Exactly. And when you're doing the color correction, it's the same thing. Everything's in 3D. It's non-destructible, so it's not hurting your original files. You're actually making a new copy of it. So it allows you to go in and do VHS tapes, do your film, your movies, just anything that you have. Where in the old days, if you wanted a VHS tape color corrected, you were looking at a lot of money and it wouldn't be worth it. Now, speaking of home movies, uh, those would have to be digitized first, obviously, before you could use it in this way. Exactly. Everything has to be digitized, as you mentioned, whether it's your VHS tapes, your Video 8, your Mini DVs, your Super 8, Regular 8, all of these have to be digitized first into, we used to always go to hard drives, but now we're using MP4s a lot because they're convenient. We can get it to the customer faster, whether you're in Dotham, Alabama, or, you know, down the street from us. As soon as we're done with the project, we don't have to go and convert it to DVDs or Blu-rays or AVIs or MOVs. It's really fast and easy to make it as an MP4. And then once it's an MP4, we can drop it in a cloud, whether it's our cloud or Dropbox or Lightjar, whatever cloud you're using, Google Drive, any of those. You can have it instantly, which saves you a couple of days and saves you a trip back to us, and it doesn't matter where you are. And with this color correction, being able to go to the old VHS movies is so totally cool because a lot of times when you have your old wedding movies, you might not have the first generation and they're kind of starting to look really, really bad. Where up till now, what we had to do is run it through kind of like a proc amp and some different kinds of equipment that basically we could either correct all your stuff to make it lighter and add some certain colors in or make it darker, whatever your problem was. However, it had to be consistent through the whole tape. So we'd look at the first five minutes, set it up, and then run your tape. But now, if you have dark areas, light areas, some place the color's correct, some place the color's not correct, you can go in with this Resolve 12 software, and you can do it frame by frame, by section, whatever you want to do. If you go and get fancy in it, start building certain kind of filters that you can do and say, oh, wow, this looks really cool here, and run it. And then 15 minutes later in the tape, you've got the same problem again, or on another tape, you've already made up those filters. And so you've got kind of these different things in your quiver, and then you just go apply them to whatever you're working on. You can ask Tom at tmcplace.com, send him an email, and maybe you'll hear your question answered on. On the show. Thanks for coming in, Tom. Good to be here. Hey, that's our show for this week. Thanks once again to Sam Rokin, the man who plays Captain John Graves Simcoe on Turn, Washington Spies on AMC. They're returning for their third season starting Monday night, April 25th at 10 o'clock Eastern Time. 
One of my favorite shows because it really portrays what life was like for our ancestors during the British occupation during the Revolutionary War. If you missed any of it, catch the podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio's talk channel, and at ExtremeGenes.com. And of course, now we transcribe every show so it's entirely searchable. So if you want to find a specific segment, go to ExtremeGenes.com under podcasts. Take care. Talk to you next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Hey!